George Malcolm McCown's family on moving from left to right is his middle son, Winston. Winston Bernard. He's passed away. He was a in World War II in the Pacific, but he was a coal miner after that in uh, Wheelwright, Kentucky. And I went to his funeral in um, 1992 because my dad and his other brother were too ill to go. <clears throat> Quite an experience. Next is my granddad, uh, George Malcolm McCown, that we talked about. And uh, Next to him is the baby boy, Hal, Hal Dale McCown. Mm -hmm. Hal was a graduate of LSU in 1940. It's strange that he's got about a hundred year uh, similarity in careers with General John Porter McCown. John Porter graduated from LSU in 1840. Well, this guy in the middle here Hal graduated from LSU in 1840, I'm sorry, 1940. Okay. And spent a career in the Army and retired a Major General. Um, he passed away in 1999. I still regret that I did not get to go to his funeral. My wife and I were in Scotland playing golf and didn't know about it until we got back. Mm. Next to him, moving more to the right, that's his mother. Her name is Myrtle June Snell McCann. Um, I don't think Grandmother Myrtle ever went to college a day in her life, but she was self-educated. She was so darn smart. She knew plants and botany and mm -hmm. people and there was, you couldn't show her a plant that she couldn't identify and give you the history of it. There. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, on the right standing is my father, George Snell McCown, Jr., or senior. Quite young there. Quite young. So I guess so. Uh, if I had to put a date on this thing, how the kid in the middle was born in about 16. He was about the same age as... R.A. Pickens. So, he so it's about 1924 or so? Yeah, I'd say that, or less. Uh, he looks about four or five years old there, maybe. So I'd say around 20. About oh, okay. Dad was born in uh, eight. So if you can right. say eight, uh, Dad is 18 there. Mm -hmm. I'd say about, you know. 1920. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to pan up to the one on the right up there, that one. Okay, let me pause. Three. Okay, what we have here is my family. Uh, my siblings and my mother and dad and I, myself. About but what year will you say that was I taken? I would say that's... Uh, 2000, well, just about 2000. Around 2000, okay. Because they moved to the nursing home in uh, 2001, very shortly after that, and passed away 2003. Right. So left to right, my brother George Jr., we call him Sonny. There on the bottom left, okay. He's uh, lives in California now, Ukiah, California. And my dad standing. Behind him, okay. And my mother sitting between me and uh, George or Sonny Jr. George Jr., Sonny. Bottom middle is your mother, Miss Gladys. Gladys. Merle, Merle Eddington. Eddington. Okay. Above her is my older sister, Jean Delry. That's the one we're wearing the red. Is that right? She is buried tall. Uh, in Walla Lake Cemetery. We brought her ashes down in 2010 when she died. In Put her right next to Grover Cleveland Eddington, there in the Eddington plot. Okay. Next is my younger sister Janice, but she's two years older than me. She was two years older than me. 
She passed away in uh, 2003, same year, same year my mother and dad died. Well, that's ironic. She died first, and then mother died, and then daddy died, spaced throughout the year. And uh, shortly after that, uh, I went to three more funerals here in Arkansas. Flew back and forth, because we were in, living in Virginia then. And that's me on the right. In the white shirt, bottom right. Okay. All right, let's pause right there. Here we go. All right, John, your birthday, June 18th, 1938. I don't have to tell you that. You know that. Your family was living in Dumas when you was born. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, we were living directly across the street from the front door of what is now the junior high building. Okay. And they're on College Street. No house is still there, a little white house. Wow. It's been expanded a little bit since we were there. Daddy bought that house in um, sometime between 1931 and 1938, because that's when Gene was born and when I was born. So he didn't have it when Gene was born, did have it when I was born. I'm not sure what year. We paid $1,500. Wow. It. That was the cost of that house back then. Wow, very good. And it's still being used today. Still being used today. It's it's <clears throat> got this money's worth. All right, well then in nineteen forty two, I guess you was about forty four years old when George and Gladys moved the family to Pickens. Is that right? Yes, he had been working uh, there in Dumas for about four jobs. Water meter. He walked town and ran water meters. He did book work for the sawmill, bookkeeper work. He uh, worked for my granddad, Grover Eddington, in the Eddington store there, which is where the uh, meta pharmacy is now. Uh -huh. So he had three jobs, not four, three jobs, holding them down during the Depression. My grandfather, Joe, uh, Grover Cleveland Eddington, was keeping him and his other two sisters, his other two daughters, Hazel and and Josie, keeping them and their families float, afloat too. My granddad, Grover Cleveland, was a very generous man and he was had a lot of property and took care of his own. That's good. And in about 42, uh, R.A. Pickens, Talk to Dad and ask him to come down and work for him. I was wondering how that came about. Um, apparently, Johnny McIntyre, who was running the store, I mean, just the, the old show, commissary, uh, had told him that he was thinking about moving here in a year or so. So, Daddy was or R.A. was planning for that. He hired Dad to come down there and work in the store, and which he did. And we moved into that house there behind the shop, right at the corner. On the lake. Okay. And Dad started working in the store. And uh, we had a big um, cow pasture out back. And cows, a cow we had at that time had twin calves, named them Lum and Abner. Lum and Abner. We had a big chicken house, a lot of chickens running all over the place, chicken yard. <clears throat> and uh, Johnny McIntyre did, in fact, leave and go to Stuttgart in uh, 1945, and Dad was elevated to be the store manager. manager. From 45 until his retirement in 68. Yes. Wow. And um, That's what, 36 years he did that? Something like that. And um, he, uh, during that time, the old store burned. Well, before we get to that, I'm going to get a shot of that old commissary real quick, just a moment. Here's the old commissary, the old original Pickens headquarters and commissary located in Pickens, Arkansas, that John's talking about right here. He became the store manager in 45, um, and shortly after that, I guess 47, 48, um, the night watchman, we always had a night watchman roving the town at night, and he carried a pistol. Okay. 
and he had one of these night watchman clocks that you had to go and get a key at every location and punch the clock that would show that he was at that location at that time and awake. <laughs> and that way you could look at the the uh, little circular piece of paper, it, you could take it out the next morning and say, okay, he was here, 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 here. No, he wasn't sleeping somewhere. Well, he woke the town up shooting his gun about, I don't know, two or three o'clock in the morning. And I'm in my bedroom, top floor of the uh, two-story house we lived in, across the street, across the railroad track from the store, next door to the Pickens. And I looked out my window and I saw a fire. He was about 10 years old at the time. Yeah. I saw a fire starting, very small fire, probably no bigger than a couple of square meters, in the lower right-hand corner of that store, that lower right-hand window. And um, that's where the meat boxes were, all the freezer boxes for the meat and the milk and eggs and all that. And they later determined that that's where the fire started at some kind of short in that. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody poured out of the houses and went over there and the fire trucks were called from Dumas. I don't know how long it took them to get there. And they fought that fire. I don't know how many hours. I stood in that big parking lot between the door and that little red brick door, which is still across the parking lot there and watch that sucker burn flat to the ground. The tallest thing standing was the safe. Oh yeah. In the office area, and the safe was no more than three feet tall. Wow. And they had to wait for days to open it because if they had opened it and the oxygen had a, hit all that heat in there. Would have burned up the contents. Burned up the contents, so they waited till it cooled down to open it. Mm. But nothing was safe. Nothing. Man. And uh, I can remember the a fellow named Roosevelt Swaggart, a black guy that worked the golf course. He, uh, he did the maintenance on the golf course for many years there later. I don't think he was at that time, but later he took care of the golf course. He told us that he had bought a hat the night before and put it on a layaway. And that was his concern. He wanted to make sure that Daddy made his hat good and they restocked the store. Wow. And, That's uh, neat. Remember that like it was yesterday. It's funny the things you remember. Mm -hmm. The other thing I remember plainly is watching R.A. pace back and forth between me and the flames. And at one point he turned to Daddy and he pointed to him and said, George, I want to open up Monday morning in that store right there, in that building right there. That little Pouring. red brick building between the mechanic shop and where right. the old commissary was, okay? Pointing to that building, and we did it. Daddy got on the phone the next day and started calling. This was like a, I think it burned on a Friday night. And um, called all the suppliers, meat, eggs, you know, and groceries and everything and got that little place stocked and opened. Wow. Because that's all the, everybody that lived on the place then, and we're talking probably 200 families that would come in with their wagons and mules and wow. whatever. So you're about 700 people in total. You're, yeah. you're, you're helping to, the family and all. To get whatever they needed at that store, whether it was a 100 pounds of flour or a stand of lard or the main things that they needed to survive. Right. And they couldn't be expected to go do much in the tra with transportation like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so R.A. knew that it had to be open and operating. He was a visionary. He certainly was. And we did it, and that store operated there the entire time they were building a new store. The when the new store opened on August 25th of 1949. So, yeah. so it's not quite a year they had that transition to the other store. Then, so. And uh, of course, Dad was very deeply involved in helping design that new store. Already had him. 
Oh, really? And lay out the interior where he wanted everything. Groceries, dry goods, storage, the office, office, and even the counters. And the, the construction people had given Daddy a little model that was supposed to be um, to scale and had a little bitty um, models of the counters and everything. And I can remember helping Dad to decide where to place those counters Wow. And how to arrange those counters on that scale, the scale thing. That's amazing. And it turned wow. out just like that. And, of course, they're screwed up now with it being pushed back and the groceries being cut back considerably. Oh, yeah, a lot of changes. But some of the original counters are still there. Oh, yeah, the original <coughs> counters are still there. Uh, the original cash registers it's still there. are still there, but on display. They're not right. used. They're not used. Mm -hmm. But my DNA is all over everything in that store. Well, uh, counters, I can understand. Cash register buttons. Uh, but we had a big grand opening, a huge grand opening. And it, I mean, that parking lot was full and everybody came. And I think it was a Wonder Bread people. They made little loaves of bread about that big, about that tall, and wrapped them in the Wonder Bread wrapping. And gave them away. Everybody wow. came with a little miniature loaf of Warner bread, and they had a cow, a, a fake cow made out of styrofoam or something. Gerald, what's the cow's name? Elsie. Elsie the cow. Mm -hmm. That uh, styrofoam thing of Elsie, almost life size, there in the store. And for years, that thing was back up in the storage area back there, over what is now the. Uh, the walk-in meat box. Right, okay. Go back there and getting stuff, and I'd look up there and I'd see LC up there. But it's not there anymore, I've looked, and it's not. Somewhere along the way, it got put away. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. But I worked for many years in that store, and uh, mainly in the grocery part. And you like to go down there now and then and oh, I do. eat with I them do, and yeah. look at the old place, and you like the latest video that you, uh, the township I filmed, so I thought mm -hmm. I, that would be a important for people to see so it's good to go back and look back at the good times in life my daddy would probably roll over in his grave if he saw that restaurant but i'll have to admit the restaurant has kept that place alive it has it, has. it is very good people come from miles around well, andrew's wife lady works back there behind the counter and dishing up uh, fried okra and everything else they have Wonderful. They're doing a great job down there. Well, tell me about Miss Lois. Uh, what's your memories of her? She, uh, she's also a living legend there. Lois was uh, pretty close to my oldest sister, Jean's age. Mm -hmm. And Lois came to work there in the late 40s. Well, she was hired around right before the commissary burn. Yeah. And she's been a fixture ever since. Uh, her dad oh, yeah. was a farm manager. Clarence James. Clarence McEwen. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she married uh, Ken Brantley, who right. passed away, mm -hmm. and she's been there in that store running it, and I bet if you held a pistol to somebody's head right now and asked them who's running Pickens, <laughs> that's St. Louis. That's true. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's that'd be, she's on my bucket list to, to interview, too, she's, one of these uh, days. She's got a very uh, central position back there on her, her desk, mm -hmm. and she just... Looks the role when you go in there. I've been absolutely her every time I go down. You want to look up the uh, somebody that's elegant. She fits the bill of being an elegant yeah. uh, person. Very polite and helpful. She's mm -hmm. helped people no matter if they're old sharecropper uh, on up. It didn't make no difference. She did what she could to help people and that's right. still did. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Some of the childhood friends you played with at the township, of course, was Andrew and. Uh, one be uh, if you want to name a few of those and talk about them you can if you want to okay uh andrew was uh three years younger than me 